Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Notable Nature with the Ontario Science Centre, part of our new series for kids and teens, Summer Spectacular, a bookish summer camp delivered straight to your home, hosted by Watts Toronto. The Word on the Street Toronto is a festival of books, ideas, and imagination, but we're also more than a festival. Watts is a community. We asked, and you told us what matters most about the Watts experience. Discovery, inspiration, connection. Our community is creative and resilient, and we're excited to bring the word on the street to you in your homes. Now, before I turn things over to our friends at the Ontario Science Centre, I would like to acknowledge that Watts Toronto operates on land that is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabek and Allied Nations to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Chikarundo is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. We are privileged to work, live, and create in this territory, and we must act with awareness and solidarity. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy, wherever you're tuning in from. Are you enjoying the Summer Spectacular so far? Give this video a like to let us know. The fun continues as we stream events and hold workshops every weekday at 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time until August 28th. Check out our website link in the banner below for information on how to register. And without further ado, let's learn more about the practice of keeping a science journal. Thanks, Yena. And I'm Heidi. And we work at the Ontario Science Centre. Like, like Watts Toronto, we are develop, developing and delivering programs virtually um, for our audiences. And we are so excited to be doing science programming with you and our summer and the Summer Spectacular. Um, now, just because the Science Centre is closed doesn't mean you have to stop doing science. In fact, the Science Centre has been doing science all summer, and we'd like to show you a little video to show you what we've been doing. Hi, I'm Donna from the Ontario Science Centre, and welcome to Summer with the Science Centre. We're so excited for you to participate in these activities with us. And here's one thing that we'd love for you to do. Could you keep a science notebook? You might be wondering, what's a science notebook? Well, it's a place where scientists write down their observations, they keep track of their data, as well as recording their thoughts. It's super helpful. And if you wanna see up close a couple of science notebooks, I've got a few examples for you right here. Hi, I'm Dash and this is my tree journal. Whenever I encounter a new tree, I like to log it in this book. I would not usually share this journal in too much detail, but we can leaf through a few pages together. This is like a personal diary of all the different trees I've met. I record any details that will help me recognize a tree in the future, along with interesting facts or popular misconceptions. If it's late in the summer or autumn, I like to collect leaves from mature trees. If I'm maple too, I sketch the leaf so that if I ever lose it, I won't need a new one. Trees need their leaves more than I do, so it isn't good to take too many. Hi, I'm Louise, and this is my science notebook. This is something I've had since my days as a graduate student in chemistry. Right now, I work on formulations for textile dyes and skincare lotions. So this is where I will work out my reaction conditions and record my observations. I'm also interested in sustainable design. So this is one of my design sketchbooks, and this is where I work out my designs and also record all my ideas. Hello friends, I'm Lizwana from the Ontario Science Centre, and this is my son, Ayan. Hello friends, I'd like to share with you a, a book about animals. This is a contents page, this is a reptile page, this is a mammal page, and this, this is an amphibian page, this is a fish page, and this is an ocean food web, and this is a bird page, and this is an insect page, and this is a life of a Life cycle of a butterfly. Hope you have a wonderful summer. Hi there, my name is Victoria, and this is my science field journal. I take it with me when I go on nature walks, and I use it to write down observations of different animals, plants, birds, and fungus that I see. I write down the location where I am, and a couple cool facts about the species I'm looking at. I even include a picture of what I've seen. 
Hi everyone, my name is Elias and this is my digital notebook. I use my notebook to keep track of all the animals that I've seen that are native to Canada. I like to decorate my notebook at the date, the time, and who was with me on that trip. I also find it very entertaining to draw what I saw or even take a picture of the animal if I have my camera on me. I also like to add a little sticky note with a fun fact written on it. Hi, my name is Rochelle and these are some of my science log books. One of the things I like to do is make paper. And I actually make log books out of a paper. And in this one, I keep samples of paper experiments that I've done. Hello, my name is Kajina, and this is my science notebook. I've been using this notebook to plan my home garden, which I started for the first time this year. Let's get right to it. Here is my vegetable garden for the year 2020. I plan to garden every year now. I started with a to-do list of things I want to do and things I need to buy. Then I did some research on what vegetables I would like to plant and some tips and tricks to help me grow them. I'm a visual learner, so I drew out how I wanted my backyard to look. Then I made goals of what I want to get done every day. And after a couple of days of watering the plants in the afternoon, I realized how much water I was using and decided to do something to save water. Here, let me show you. Here you see some of the tomatoes. And here are some fresh salads that I'll be using for lunch later. What's in your science notebook? What's in your science notebook? What's in your log book? What's in your science notebook? What's in your science notebook? What's in your science notebook? Make your own notebooks! Wow, Heidi, so many great ideas for science notebooks. I know, yes. I'm inspired. Yes. Do you keep a science notebook? Uh, I just started. Um, I, I started doing sourdough uh, like everybody else this summer. <laughs> um, so I did keep, I have a science notebook at home that's blogging all my experiments with trying to get the perfect sourdough. Yeah. Well, you saw my science notebook in the video, um, but did you know People have been keeping records and observations for thousands of years, even before they even thought of themselves as scientists. Yeah, no you know? surprise. One of the most important things that a scientist can do is to record their observations of nature and record all the experiments they're doing so that they can pass it on to other scientists who might, might want to try. So I'd like to play a little game with the audience and you too, Heidi. It's something that I like to call notebook or not. So the idea is you're going to guess whether or not these are notebooks, and we'll see what, what, what kind of interesting things people have done in the okay. past. Okay, okay, okay. So can you guess what this is? Is this a notebook or not? Um, is that a cave painting? A cave painting. Okay, so maybe it's not really a notebook the way we think of science notebooks, but did you know that these cave paintings are anywhere from 11,000 to 35,000 years old? Can you see what people back then drew on the walls? Yeah. It, what do you see? It's, it's actually pretty they're amazing how realistic they are. Mm -hmm. um, I see a deer and a bison and there might, I think there's people down at the bottom there. So yeah, I mean, it's not an actual book but it is a record of their experiences and what they saw. Yeah. Did you all see the animals on those cave paintings? Now, let's try this, something a little harder. What do you think this is, Heidi? Looks like a big slab of rock. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to be carrying that around. No. But you know, the ancient Babylonians, well, they would look up at the sky and they recorded all these lunar eclipses. We think of lunar eclipses today, and um, they have been recording them for, you know, over a thousand years. It's kind of hard to read ancient Babylonian, and I actually wouldn't want to carry this around in my pocket. So let's see if we can find something a little more portable. Any ideas what this is? A um, uh, necklace? Kind of looks <laughs> like it, eh? It looks like a weaving. But did you know in South America, Andean peoples for over a thousand years have been carrying around these kind of records. Um, 
It's called a kipu. And can you guess why there might be strings and knots there? Um, I don't know. Is it maybe a little bit like an abacus or something? Kind of. They didn't really do math. Apparently, um, special people who kept these kipu records would use the different colors of string to record the different families and communities that were in a different location. You could use the knots to count different things. Definitely more portable, but it took somebody very specialized in order to read something like this. So that's a kind of a, a, a code in string and knot form then? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of neat too, eh? Yeah. Now, of course, when books and paper were invented, it got a lot easier to share notes. Any guesses what this is? Okay, yeah, this is definitely a notebook, and it does look really familiar. Yeah. Um, Leonardo see? da Vinci. Yeah, that's right. He was a va very famous artist and scientist. And you can see on his journals, he looked at birds. In fact, this is what he called the Codex on the Flight of Birds. And he studied them, he made detailed drawings. And you know what? They inspired his invention called an ornithopter. You heard of an ornithopter before? Yes, yeah. I have. It's a flying machine. He thought he could get people to fly if, he, if they had wings like birds. Now, he never really invented, he didn't, never really built it, but um, <laughs> still kind of fun to think. You know what's really fun about this journal too, Heidi? Can you look at the writing there? It does look backwards, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So Leonardo da Vinci wrote everything in mirror writing, which means if you hold his notebooks up to a mirror, you'd be able to read it. So it's it's not exactly a code, but, and I, I'm not sure people know why he did that precisely, but you were telling me earlier that he was left-handed. Yeah. So, and when you're left-handed and writing from left to right, you could smear the ink. So maybe he was trying to keep maybe. from doing that. I don't know, it's kind of like a mystery, just mm. like Mona Lisa's smile. <laughs> <laughs> now, maybe you can guess what, what's being uh, recorded here. We've got two very different oh, texts. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Okay. So, okay. The one on the right looks a lot like the moon, phases of the moon, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that's really quite realistic, actually, even though they're paintings. And then the other one, okay, maybe orbits of planets or something. Actually, they're both phases of the moon oh. from different cultural perspectives. The pictures, that, the page that you see over on the right, that's Galileo's drawings. He observed the moon over 400 years ago with the help of a telescope. Wow. But um, in medieval times, we had Ar uh, Islamic people who studied the moon too. And if you look very carefully, the writing here is also from left to right. Right, right to left. Right to left, yeah. sorry. <laughs> because it's written in Arabic. Kind of like Da Vinci's uh, books too. Yeah, I love how they also were writing in these blocks that make it look really graphic, um, interesting graphically. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like an artwork also. Wow. Now, this, no, this, I'm not sure. Can you guess what this is? Well, it's definitely a science notebook. Looks like it. There's a lot of yeah. formulas there. Yeah. Now, for the, those of you in the audience, you might not know, this is probably the world's most dangerous science notebook because it belonged to a famous scientist. Her name was Marie Curie. Oh. Yeah. She studied radioactivity. She discovered new elements, polonium and radium. And her notebooks are actually also radioactive. She won the, she's the first woman and the only woman to actually win both the Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry. Isn't wow. That amazing? And her notebooks have to be stored in lead. And they're going to be radioactive, scientists think, for at least 1,500 years. We can't even touch her books. That's wild. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Now, let's see. This one, last one is a tricky one. Maybe you can figure out. Notebook or not? Eh. Oh, okay. So uh, this looks like a blog post about Minecraft. Again, it's sort of like back to the cave paintings. It's not technically a book but it looks like it's a record of, of experiences and of observations. Yeah, and why not? You know, everybody's got digital devices. You might not have paper ready 
but maybe you've got something that you can record on. Maybe this is the notebook of the future. And maybe you can even do your science observations in Minecraft. I know a lot of people out there love Minecraft. So it gets back to my question. What's in your science notebook? <laughs> <laughs> and what is your science notebook? Yeah. <laughs> well, what's in my science notebook is, as you saw from the video, um, I like to make paper samples and whatnot. And I know you make paper here at the Ontario Science Center. So maybe you can uh, show us how we can make not only a science journal, but make our own paper to go into that science journal. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, excellent. Um, so yeah, so we, you've got this great um, sa uh, sampling of different journals, but um, and most of them are made in a factory. But what you can do is make your own paper, and it's a lot easier than a lot of people think. So uh, we're gonna make, I'm gonna make recycled paper today. And um, let's start by talking a little bit about what paper's made from. So we've got, oh, I know. Um, I'm gonna make it out of scrap paper. So these are just photocopies. Not wood? From, well, let me get into that. Because oh. <laughs> the scrap paper is made with fiber from trees and uh, that would be a little hard to make into paper in like 15 minutes oh yeah that that take that probably takes about a week to, to process the fiber from that wood but there's a lot of fiber in trees um it's not the only source of fiber we but most most often what we make paper from comes from plants um now Obviously, like we said, that is not going to be practical. So we're going to use scrap paper uh, and make recycled paper. But let's show them a couple of other samples of different kinds of sources of fiber. Wow, all from nature, eh? Yeah. So these come from grasses or um, bushes or trees. And um, they get harvested in very particular ways and then you have to cook them up specially. And basically the fiber inside the plants makes up the cell walls and there's a natural glue that holds those fibers or little hairs together. And you have to cook them in order to separate the fibers and then you have to mash them in order to make them short enough to, to be practical for making paper. So um, the, it's a lot of work and um, We've, we've, as people, as humans, we've known how to do this for uh, over 2,000 years now. Um, like the, the Chinese culture figured it out um, way back when. They figured out how to make it into a process. Wow. Yeah, I think we knew how to make it before that, but it was more accidental. Um, and they figured out how to, how to, and they probably had science notebooks <laughs> and records of how to do that as well. Um, and then for centuries afterwards, we were making it by hand and doing that laborious process of, of grinding the fibers and cooking them and mashing them up and then finally making the paper. But with, um, with recycling, what we can do is use that fiber that's already been processed and make it much faster and, and easier. So I've torn, we've torn up uh, the, the photocopy paper that I showed you earlier, some of that, and into pieces about as big as a postage stamp. You guys remember what a postage stamp is? <laughs> um, it's a bit of a throwback. Um, and to make it even easier, we're using our blender, and I've soaked some of those, those um, scraps. Now, you can also use other kinds of paper, uh, including tissue paper and wrapping paper that doesn't have plastic or foil on it. Um, paper has also been made out of fabric over the years, but like making it out of wood and other plant fibers, that's a lot of work as well. Um, and uh, we, I, I particularly like photocopy paper. Newsprint is okay, but there's a lot of ink on newsprint and it kind of comes out looking kind of gray and mud, muddy looking. So um, photocopies are great because they are um, much more white and there's less less ink on or toner on them. Okay, so ideally you want to soak it for a little while. I take two generous handfuls of paper and uh, into the blender and just over halfway full of water. And then you want to blend it until you don't see any little pieces of paper anymore. It's 
So roughly 20 seconds or so. It looks like a milkshake. There's my smoothie. Oh, I wouldn't want to drink that. <laughs> no, you could drink it. It's not going to kill you, but there's a lot of fiber in it. So it could send you to the bathroom a lot more often. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm going to add it to a vat that already has some water in it. This is my paper making vat. And at the moment, what I've got is pulp in water, um, sort of like that smoothie or soup. And it's what we call a slurry. So I'm going to add it to some, some slurry I blended up earlier. And then I'm going to color my paper with some scraps made out of paper from one of our exhibits. So color paper, using color paper is the easiest way to get, um, to color your own paper. Tissue paper is great too, but you can also use paints and dyes or inks as well. It's, um, they're just not as concentrated. Okay, so we've got to blend that into our blue smoothie. And in case you're wondering if you can use your kitchen blender, sure you can, but I don't know if you'd really want to, um, considering that there's ink and toner and paper color on there and uh, fiber that you maybe don't want to ingest. So um, <laughs> I'd suggest getting a secondhand um, blender at a, at a yard sale or a thrift store. All right, so we've got our slurry. It's looking all right. I'm liking it. You can also experiment with different color combinations, but whatever you add, just keep in mind that it will get all mixed together. So it's kind of cool to try um, experimenting with, with controlling what kind of color you come up with. All right, so this is a really nice looking slurry, mm -hmm. but it's a little boring. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I want to jazz it up a little okay. bit. So I'm going to add inclusions. So that can be, that's anything that doesn't make uh, part of the structure of the paper. And you can, there's a whole uh, set of options for inclusions. And what I'm gonna add is some dried plant material. So some crumbled up uh, rose petals and eucalyptus leaves. It smells really good. Wow. Yeah. Will that make your paper smell like that after? when it's For a little while, yeah, it will. Yeah, I've also done lavender paper and uh, herbal tea paper, which smelled really good too. Anything that's kind of flat and um, fairly smallish is, is a really good um, thing to have as an inclusion. So we've got all kinds here at the Science Center for our paper making, including like these colorful um, dots from, uh, their, their polka dots from uh, hole punches in, um, exhibit from an exhibit. And uh, this is colorful thread from our, our uh, the weaving at, at our Jacquard loom, which is right across from the paper making area. Um, we used to use glitter as an inclusion, but no, microplastic. And when we would clean up, it would get washed down the drain and into the water system. And that's really bad for the environment. So, but we still like some bling once in a while. So I switched over to cutting up, collecting and cutting up candy foil candy wrappers into bigger pieces that get caught by our strainers when we're cleaning up so they don't go down the drain uh, the only uh, caution here is if it's not plant-based material you can't recycle the paper again down the line so this uh, this would be end of the line paper you would you would if you're finished with it you'd be putting it in the garbage instead and that's um Another reason why we wouldn't use foil cover wrapping paper to make our recycled paper, but I might use it as an inclusion. So I might cut this up too. Um, okay, so now we move on to actually making the paper. Um, now you don't need gloves, but I do wear them because uh, I have um, a skin condition and if I get my skin wet, it kind of hurts, so this really helps me a lot. But to get those fibers that have been blended up in the paper, 
uh, and get them and make them into paper, we need a mold and a decal. And we've got these really beautiful, fancy ones that were made for us by the talented people at the Science Center. The mold is a, a frame with a screen stretched on top of it. And I'll bet you can guess how this works. So uh, what's going to happen is the water is going to flow through the screen and the screen will catch those fibers. It's almost like magic. But to make our paper, uh, give it for, to give it its shape and its size and a straight edge, you need a, a frame on top called a decal. So you can see how these two fit together really beautifully. Um, what if people don't have that at home, Heidi? Yeah, good question. It's easy to make one at home. Oh. I've got some samples here. This is one I made myself a few years ago out of some frames from the dollar store. These were actually uh, canvases that you could paint on. And I just took off the canvas and then I used the frame underneath. And this is wind aluminum window screening. I stapled it onto the, a frame and then I, I trimmed it with uh, waterproof duct tape so that uh, the, the sharp edges wouldn't stick out and it would uh, stay together. You just wanna make sure that that, that mesh is nice and taut or tight. Um, and then the decal just rests right on top of it like that. Uh, we also have, this one is one of my faves actually, cause it's so creative. It's just, the frame is an embroidery hoop and then this is window screening as well. It's, this is actually um, fiberglass window screening. So it's a little bit less um, uh, tight, uh, but it, it does work and you, it produces a circular piece of paper. Um, and, or you can just make it out of, make your frame out of a, a very stiff piece of cardboard and wrap it in that duct tape or, or varnish it somehow. You can also, if you don't have window screening, you can use mesh. Uh, the mesh on here is very fine. And on the window screening here, it's much bigger. So something in between would work perfectly. Uh, I've seen people use ni a nylon pantyhose before, uh, which is okay, but it's not very, it's, it's pretty uh, loose. And that can cause some issues later when you're trying to remove it from the I got to write screen. all of those down in my science journal because I have to try all of those. Maybe you want to try that too. <laughs> yeah, you guys taking notes? Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do is put these two pieces together. I'm going to stir up my slurry a little bit. Just give it a very gentle swish. And then I make sure that the screen is facing up towards the ceiling. So screen to the sky, decal on top. And then I just dip down pull up, give it a little shimmy to spread the fibers apart and let the water flow through the screen. And then when it doesn't look like it's flooded with water anymore, I can carefully remove the decal and there's my paper, ta-da! Wait, is that really paper? Technically, yeah. It's just that it's really soft paper. It's more like wet fiber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are clinging together, but they're really, it's wet paper is weak paper. So luckily, as you saw, if I make a mistake, like where I, I run my finger over it, I can easily fix it by just turning it upside down and kissing it down to the surface of my slurry. But let me do that again. Swish, swish, swish. Let it drip tip off the excess, and then carefully tip off the decal. All right, so yeah, technically this is paper, it's just super duper wet paper. So now we've got to get it off the mold. Um, what's one, one really cool thing about this is, uh, as you already saw, you can actually turn it right upside down and the surface tension of the water will hold the, the fibers to the mold but we wanna get this off the mold. So we're gonna to have to get rid of some of that water. And I'm going to do that by transferring this to another surface. Now you can see here, this is actually a curved board called a couching board um, from the French word couché <laughs> to lay something down. So I'm laying this down on my curved couching board. Now you're not gonna have a couching board at home. So just use your tabletop or your counter. And on top of that, you wanna put an old towel I've got something here set up so that this is sort of similar to what you might do at home. And then on top of that, you wanna have something smoother, a smoother piece, a piece of fabric. Um, 
In the case of my Cushing board here, for the instead of the towel, I have this wool felt, which is really, really durable, and it lasts us years here at the Science Center. And on top of that, a smooth fabric called interfacing. Um, and that you can get at a fabric store. It's something that uh, people use when they're sewing shirts and things to make their collars and cuffs reinforced. You can also use a tea towel. And in this case, I've, what I've got here is a, a J cloth. So on the Cushing board, what the curve means that I can actually just push down and jiggle my mold to press water out of my paper and it gets forced down into the felt. And then when I think I've had enough press, it's had enough pressing, I can grab the mold by one edge and then peel it off carefully and ta-da! Transferred or couched to the interfacing. Wow. I love that moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, now I'm gonna do it on the J cloth so you can see the whole process again. Rochelle, is there one, anything you wanted to add right now that I've missed or are we doing okay? No, we're doing fine. Good? Okay. I just wondered how come you're not using any glue? Ah, that's a good question. Well, the water will keep the fibers on the screen, but the, how do they stay, how do the fibers stay to uh, cling to each other? Well, there's a, a weak static force called Van der Waals forces. And if you multiply, and that runs along the length of each fiber. And if you multiply that force by the number of fibers in a piece of paper, which can number into the billions, that's actually a pretty strong force for the wow. type of structure that it is, right? Oh, maybe we can show a microscopic image of those fibers. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. If Please you do. Put in that. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do right now, as you get that picture, mm -hmm. is I'll transfer this to the J cloth, and there, Rochelle's going to let's have that wide view. Or oh, sorry. <laughs> Anyway, you can see the crisscross of the fibers. This is a, an electron microscope um, uh, close up. It's, I don't know how many times it's, it's magnified. It's like over 200 times. And uh, you can see how those fibers are all tangled up together and they tighten as they dry out. So they will tangle a, into a very tight um, web or um, it's also known as felting uh, to create the paper. The, the strength of the paper. And you might be wondering what that thing in the corner is. Um, Rochelle, what is it? It looks like a fish. I know, or some people guess insect, but it's actually the tip of a ballpoint pen. <laughs> yeah, so that gives you an idea of how much that's magnified. So that's what's happening with our paper over here. Now, I, as I said, I prepared one sort of setup here that's similar to what you might have at home with an old towel underneath to, to absorb the water and then a J cloth on top to rest my paper. And then in this case, because I can't really do a lot of this sort of tipping and, and pressing all over, I'm just gonna use a sponge on the back of the mesh pretty gently. I don't wanna stretch the mesh. The looser the mesh, the harder it is to remove the paper. There, okay, so hopefully that's enough. And then I peel, and nope, not yet. So I'm gonna try again and press just a little bit harder and hope that it works this time. Well, you know, in science, when things don't work, we have gotta find out why. That's so. true. Okay, what I'm gonna do this time is I'm going to press my J cloth to my paper. There we go. So I've taken a little corner of it, pressed the J cloth up to it, and then carefully peeled the paper off the mold. But yeah, it doesn't always work. And I have plenty of paper disasters to show for it. Well, that's how you learn. Yeah, so there it is. Um, now, we at the Science Center, when we have our paper making show, we like to have the paper ready um, uh, and able to be carried from one point to another. So we speed up the drying process by pressing more water out. And Rochelle, do you want to roll up our, sure. our, hand, our super duper screw press? This is like mega pressure for squeezing out water, which is awesome. And uh, it's, it still leaves the paper a little bit damp, but um, 
it's much stronger than it is when you first make it. And then we use these pressing boards, fold our paper up between those layers of fabric and add some paper that can soak up uh, the excess water and then press it all in the press. Um, but you're not likely to have a big screwing, screw press at home. So you can leave your paper on the counter if you have the room and let's let it dry overnight, air dry. Or you can press it under some heavy books or bricks. Uh, just make sure that you're changing out the fabric every so often so, so that you're not letting uh, the moisture soak into, the, into whatever it is you're pressing paper with. Um, and then when, once it's dry, it might be a little bit ripply, but you can iron that out on a low setting between a couple of pieces of clean paper. And that is, and that will give you um, paper that you can use for your science notebook. <laughs> That's so cool, Heidi. In fact, we have some science, uh, some paper that we've made here at the Science Center in previous shows, all different colors, all different inclusions. Um, Maybe we could play a guessing game later with what's in here. But for now, what we can do is actually take uh, some of these papers and turn them into a science notebook. Something, I think you made these, didn't you, Heidi? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show this one off quickly. So this was, um, uh, this was actually a pretty quick job. I used my, my handmade paper, um, punched, a punched a couple of holes at the top, and um, the covers come from an old shoe box. So I just cut them a little bigger than my, my pages. And uh, I used one of my sheets of paper as sort of the guide for punching the rest of the holes. Um, so it's kind of like the stencil, if you will. And I also used that on my cardboard, marked out the holes, punched them, and then I strung them all together with these loops of, of paper string. Uh, the one thing to note is that you should make the loops big enough so that you can easily open your notebook. I figured that out the hard way. <laughs> but it's an easy one, easy thing to fix. And I covered the, the, the tops of the covers with some uh, scrap wrapping paper that I had at home. So to make it pretty. Yeah, so you had started um, some paper here. So I'm gonna take this and I saw what you did with um, this cardboard. Yeah, right? that's an alternative cover. So it's a little, it's, uh, it's made out of car, uh, cereal box car, cardboard. Cereal. Well, um, and instead of two separate pieces, I've made it one piece with sort of a spine in the middle. Mm -hmm. So you'd fold it over. So, and then you can take your, your hole punch, you can punch, use, use your uh, paper as a guide. Oh, there, and look it, we even have confetti that we can add to our Excellent. new paper. Or when we make we'll our next We'll just add batch. it to this bag yeah. when we're done. And then, oh, I could have, should have done that with two pieces of cardboard. Um, well, actually, uh, what we'll do is, for now, I could, because the, the beauty of doing it this way is you can always untie your string, um, your binding, and then, add some more paper to your notebook if you have lots and lots of ideas. So I'm just gonna thread this through here like so. And there are different ways that you can bind your journals, but like Heidi said, you wanna give a little slack so that um, you can flip your, your paper. Um, something like that. I'll just tie a little knot like so for now, and then we can always untie it, add some more if you have new ideas, and you can have a science journal that looks like that, or you can do something a little bit more fancy where you can braid the, your, um, binding. your binding like so. And of course, maybe you don't have any of those things, or if you wanna do it even simpler, you can take a stapler and just staple it all together, why not? But sometimes you don't have any of these things, and you still have to make your science um, notebook or, or observations. You can make a little science notebook from just one sheet of paper, just like this. That is super yeah. cute. It is, eh? Um, and all you need is to be able to fold your paper in half. And I, um, So you're gonna fold it in half this way, and then you're gonna fold your piece of paper again in half like that, so it kind of looks like this. 
And then you're just going to open up your piece of paper, fold it in half again, make sure everything matches, then fold um, your paper down so that you get a long rectangle. So fold it in half. And I always like to mark it so because you don't want to cut all the way through. But this is where the neat stuff happens. So you now have a grid of um, 16 squares. I marked it so that I'm going to cut the lines just very quickly. So you're doing so, an accordion fold in one direction, so the mm -hmm. vertical direction, and then you're doing an accordion fold in the horizontal direction to make your grid? That's correct. Okay. Just folding in half each time. And then along each fold, you're cutting. Oh, you're yeah. stopping before at yeah. the last fold. That's really important. Don't cut all the way through. Otherwise, you're not going to have a notebook. You'll have just pieces of paper. A bunch of squares. <laughs> well, you can still yeah. staple them together. You can still but. staple them together, but just in case you don't have a stapler. And then turn it over so it looks like this. And now you're going to cut just along that middle fold, but not all the way through, just like we said before. And this is the neat thing. Everything all folds together like that on both sides because you've done all your folding. Oops. And then you should have something that kind of looks like that. And then you fold it over like that. And then we'll fold it down again, <laughs> oops, <laughs> like this. It's easier on a tabletop. So you're folding back and forth at the yeah, end. Yeah, okay. back and forth. And then you want to take one like that. And now you have a science notebook that kind of looks like that. So, and you can add all sorts of things. I think what I'm going to do after this program is I'm going to go out there and I'm going to look for little things that I can put in paper next time. And then I'm going to write that down, maybe take some samples and then put that in my science notebook. So I'll remember what I want to do next time. Oh, so this yeah. is your, going to be your, your science, your inclusion uh, notebook. That's right. Cool. It will be my little science notebook inclusion for paper making. <laughs> Notebook. <laughs> are you going to do keep a science journal now? Oh, for sure. Yeah. What are you going to put in your science notebook? Well, I've got my sourdough science notebook already started. So for this one, I think what I'm going to do is start experimenting with, um, I've been getting really interested in natural dyes and pigments out of plants. Um, so I think I'll probably start keeping a record of different formulas that I come up with for different plant dyes and, and also uh, maybe add, uh, include some samples that uh, of the different examples of what I've done. So I think it'll be really handy for that. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know what? I actually also would like to know what everybody else out there is doing with their science notebooks. And yeah. yeah, if you were taking pictures and you're recording some interesting things in nature, why don't you take photographs and tag the Science Center and also let Word on the Street uh, Summer Spectacular know what you've been doing with your science notebook. Um, it, you, you never know what you're going to learn when you're out there. And you never know what kind of inspiration you'll get from looking back at your science notebook. Maybe you'll invent sort of an or ornithopter or who knows, it could be something else, right? <laughs> A and whole new flying machine. A whole new flying <laughs> machine. Yeah. And then again, if you don't have paper, maybe you can do it all in Minecraft or some other digital way. The most important thing, though, is just to keep looking, just to keep observing, just to keep recording, just to keep doing science. Right? Yeah. 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 So my name is Rochelle. I'd like to thank you uh, so much for joining us with uh, for the Word on the Street Summer Spectacular and Notable Nature. And I'm Heidi. I we've been so excited to share all this with you today. And we hope that we see you one day at the Science Center. We look forward to seeing you here sometime. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you so much to Heidi and Rochelle and to all the wonderful, talented folks at the Science Center. Um, I know that I was totally inspired and went and fetched my own science notebook where I have 
sketches of plants and animals that I find when I go places. So, you know, all kinds of things you can do with the wonderful skills that you've learned today. So thank you so much for sharing everything with us, Heidi, Rochelle. If you enjoyed today's event, please give this video a like. And if you want to join us for more fun tomorrow, there are more details at thewordonthestreet.ca slash Toronto, or you can tune in here on the Watts Toronto channel. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.